My name is Dave Morrow. Nine months of each year, I live out of my vehicle. I travel the wilderness by foot on an endless backpacking and landscape photography trip. I want to teach and share the photography and outdoor skills that I use on these trips. I don't want to spend hours editing video or sitting in front of a computer, so I made some rules. First, everything shot on GoPro. This was the best way I found to record quickly on a consistent basis. Second, I can only spend 20 minutes editing each video. So thanks for watching, and welcome to the Landscape Photography Journals. So I just got up here, me and my buddy Iron hiked up, probably like seven miles, wanted to get some shooting up in the snow. It's really nice fall conditions right now. So here's the trail, our camp's tucked back on this ridge line. Massive volcanic peak right there. The light's not really good right now, so normally if I don't have light over, say, like the entire landscape, such as back in here, hitting the specific trees and ridge lines, it's kind of hard to get the depth of this kind of scene without light flooding across it. And since everything's getting backed up on the horizon that way, I'm probably just going to take shots at maybe 150 to 200 millimeters, somewhere in that range, and zoom in kind of on the ridge lines right in front of the peak right there, and then some stuff back in here as well. And I find when I'm zooming in much further on scenes where there's not a whole lot of light, I can normally salvage some really nice black and white shots or some color shots as well because I'm much more zoomed in on that detail. So in post-processing I can bring out a lot of the leading lines really nicely as well as any transition from foreground to background. So the first shot I'm going to set up and take is going right back this way. I'm going to try to get some of this snow right down in here balancing the right hand foreground of the summit right on the left hand foreground and then some of this nice cloud movement and drama up in the sky I'll try to bring into it. So first shot here you can see the back of my screen composition as I talked about earlier balanced on the right hand side by this ridge line and then that kind of shows the scale of that mountain in the background. Massive glaciated peak. So before we proceed with the actual shooting technique for this image, I wanted to in-depth review the composition and why I chose the composition I did for this scene. So here's the scene that I'm about to shoot, which you see in the video right now. But I got really lucky, and as a few minutes pass while I'm teaching, the light gets better, and then even better again. So I'll actually review this composition right here with you guys. So when I shot this in the field, I actually use a technique called exposed to the right. So I'll review that soon, but it makes the image much brighter than it actually needs to be, allowing me to capture more dark detail down here and still darken the image and highlights back where it needs to be. But let's get to the composition discussion. The first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to ensure that this large peak right here, getting this really nice light, was in the very top of the composition. If I had put this large peak in the center ground down in here, it wouldn't have looked as large in the scene. And you'll even be able to see that if I quickly crop this and bring it down here, which I won't in the final image, but if I did, that would make the scene even look more dominated by that large mountain's peak. So whenever I'm shooting large peaks like this, and I'm gonna have some nice color in the sky which I can bring out in post, it will be no problem for me to have the composition and the peak centered exactly where it is. So I'm keeping that in the top third of the composition. Next, I have this nice line coming from my left, leading my eye right up here to the mountain. So it kind of moves up this line, catches this nice snow field right here, and that draws it up to the center of attention peak right here. So I always find that if you have something that will lead your eye from the left up towards the right, it works very well in compositions. For most of us in the world, we're used to reading from left to right, so having something that grabs your attention down here and move it up always works very well. I also like that there is some nice scale to the scene because you can see these massive old growth trees and then you can see how much higher up the summit is and kind of get a sense for what's going on. I don't necessarily like the color of these trees. I will probably desaturate them in the final image, making the final image closer to what it actually looked like out in the field. 
but we'll go over that in the actual editing session. The last thing I really like about this image is that there is some detail in the center ground and it kind of offsets here with this snow down here. So there are no boring parts to my composition. So if I cut this into horizontal thirds, third here, third here, I have interesting detail in all of those thirds so my eye doesn't get bored anywhere in the scene. When I go about the post-processing of this, I will probably darken or vignette some of the edges. If I go right here, you can see kind of what that will look like, but this is a little bit too strong. That'll kind of help my eyes to retain tension here in the center without wandering to some of the dead space here on the outside. But you can check that out later on in the post-processing session. So now let's jump back to the field for the capturing of this image. So looking at live view here, the first thing I'll do is focus in my approximate hyperfocal point. That's after I make sure that everything's level here. So I just use that single point spot focus. You can check out my hyperfocal and focusing tutorial, which I'll link below, if you want to learn about my full focusing technique. So approximate hyperfocal here. And this first shot I'm going to take is at 50 millimeters. So it's not that far zoomed in yet. Still getting some nice light coming down the side here, so I'm going to take advantage of that while it still exists. So I'm just going to focus about a third in here. And then I'm going to zoom in 100%. And I'll just dial my focal ring right here, back and forth while watching the camera. And that looks sharp to my eyes while zoomed in at 100% there. So that's the first thing. Next thing I'm going to do is just dial in my f-stop. And I'm shooting in aperture priority mode, so automatically that dials in my shutter speed according to the exposure compensation, which I'll set next. So next thing I'm going to do here, I'll just grab my info button here. And cycle through until I have my RGB histogram up. Now I'm going to expose this histogram all the way to the right, which will give me more information about this actual scene than I would get if I had my regular exposure, like right here. So if I don't blow out any of the highlights, I can bring all that exposure, which is overexposed, dropping it back down in post-processing. Gives me more dark detail information without losing any of the highlights, so better overall image quality. So that's called exposed to the right. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to open my f-stop just to dial in the histogram using exposure value. So I will link one of my past videos which talks about what to do when you don't have enough light in your scene. Sometimes you have to open your f-stop just so enough live view light comes in here that you can dial in your histogram. Now I can use exposure compensation right here. Watching my histogram I'm going to push it all the way to the right or brighter until it's pushed up to the very edge there. Now this image on the back of my screen is brighter than what I'm actually seeing but I'm collecting more information about the dark details than I would have with the standard exposure and then I can just darken it back down. So all good to go there. So that's exactly the exposure I want for this shot. Now I can move my f-stop back to f11. Everything should be good to go. My exposure's dialed in and I'll take the shot. So if you want to learn more about the technical information or the step-by-step -step process I use to dial in all those settings, I have an exposure triangle guide which goes into why I choose which settings first, second, third, fourth, and kind of the thought process or logical sequence of how I choose my camera settings. And if you memorize that, the nice aspect is you won't have to go out and wonder if you're shooting at the right settings every time you shoot. So I will leave a link below and you can download that. It's a long PDF that's like 12,000 words, and it'll give you my step-by-step -step instructions for shooting out in the field. And you can take that out on your iPhone or your Android or whatever, and you can kind of read it. And if you run into trouble while out shooting, you can quickly reference that guide. It's got tons of examples and other stuff that'll help you out. So I'll leave that below the video. So now I have my shot pulled up here. This is just image review. So this is the shot I just took. I'll zoom in on my focal point, make sure that's sharp. And after I make sure that's sharp, I'll check directly above it and directly below it while zoomed in. I normally zoom in about five clicks from the full-size image on my zoom. If I zoom in really far, I start to see kind of the pixelation of the image, and I can't tell if it's sharp or not. So maybe full view here, and then one, two, three, four, five. That gives me about 100% zoom, so I can tell if I have a sharp focus. Next thing I'll check here 
is my histograms. You can see my RGB histogram is pushed all the way right. My red is within the bounds of highlights to shadows. Same with green, but blue is slightly blown out. That means I'm blowing out some of this color that's up there. You can see peaks are getting some nice light right here right now. So all I have to do there is stop down by approximately a stop and I'll fire off another shot. Now that will ensure that I don't blow out the blue channel. So I'll have everything within the bounds of highlights on the right to darks on the left. Really nice light back here, poking through here. Looks great back there right now. And I can see the blue is now within the bounds of highlights to darks. Everything else checks out. So sometimes the RGB might be a little bit bright even though it's not blown out, one of the other channels might be blown out. So you got to check the RGB, which is the top, plus red, green, and blue channels individually. Get a shot of this right now and zoom in while the light's still good. So when you're out shooting in the field, the back of your camera has an sRGB color space histogram, which is much more confined than the actual raw histogram that you see within Lightroom right here. So if you'll remember, when we were out shooting this first shot in the field, it showed that my blue channel was blown out. So the RGB would have shown my blue channel pushed all the way off the edge like this. But in reality, when I get back into Lightroom, I can see that the blue is all the way up to the very right edge, meaning it's almost blown out. But you can see there's that small space right here, meaning I still retained all the detail in the blue channel. So it's always good to test your specific camera and see how far you can push that RGB histogram in the field past the highlights, blowing out or clipping them, while still retaining full dark detail down here and full highlight detail when getting back into Camera Raw. So what you'll notice is that when you get back into Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom or wherever you process your raw files, you'll have a lot more space down in your darks and up in your highlights than you would when shooting that RGB histogram out in the field. So this is much more forgiving than your RGB histogram, which is great because you can expose all the way right in the field, slightly clipping your RGB channel, which is this gray area, or the specific red, green, and blue channels, and you still won't actually clip them when getting back into the computer and post-processing that shot. So if we look at this next one, this is the one that I actually darkened down by a single stop. And you can see it's one stop darker here in the histogram. So I could have still gotten away with this first shot without darkening down that exposure by a single stop in exposure compensation. So this one is actually darker, collecting less dark detail and giving me worse image quality than the first one. So that's why it's always good to test your camera. And I wanted to show you guys that in the field so we could do this little experiment back on the computer here. If I go to this last shot here, you can see that the brightest color is magenta, which is representing this right up here in the peaks. But technically, I could have pushed this exposure probably another stop up and exposure compensation and still gotten all this detail here, but I would have collected more information about the darks than I would have in the exposure that I actually captured. Not a huge deal, but if you want to optimize your exposure, you should test out how far you can push your histogram in the field, and what that histogram is actually going to look like back home on the computer.